Happy New Year to everyone who's chosen to uh, tune, in, tune in and worship with us today. Um, that is Perry Beach's SDA Church. Well, I normally I'm a person who reflects a lot. I do reflect about work, about so many things in general. And yesterday when I was reflecting, my mind was drawn back to 2006 when myself and my family, we went to the uh, seaside. And when we were there, my children convinced me to uh, go on this ride because they were going on different rides. So they convinced me to go on this ride. And lo and behold, I made an informed choice to go on the ride. Wow, that was one of the worst experiences of my life. While we were on the ride, some people were excited, screaming with excitement and things like that, but I was just holding on this rail and praying and I was like, God, can this ride come to an end? But dare I say, I had made, made an informed choice to go on the ride, but that wasn't a good choice. Wow, as we go into 2021, um, uh, I know that most of us, if we look back, we've made some um, not so good choices. And as a result, we've suffered uh, because of the choices we've made. But at the same time, on the contrary, there are some situations or some challenges that we've gone through, which is not of our own choice that we haven't chosen to be in. For example, the, 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 uh, the talk of the town or the talk of the um, century this, these days is being this COVID-19. Uh, most people or most of us have uh, gone through a lot because of this um, coronavirus and most people have lost loved ones, lost family members, even breadwinners. Some people have been affected, um, they've lost jobs, they've lost so many things and we've prayed to God. Even those people who don't believe, we've prayed to God and sometimes we feel like God is silent. I'm here to encourage everyone who's chosen to worship with us today to say, hold on my brother, hold on my sister. The God who was there in the beginning is still our God today and he is going to see us through. Jesus said, your part would be over life's temptation see. Unknown waves before me roll, hiding rock and treasures show, charts and covers come from thee. Jesus, Savior, follow me. As a mother steals a child, thou canst touch a ocean wild, boisterous way. Says to them, be still, wondrous sovereign of the sea. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. When the lads are near the shore and the fearful breakers roll, treats me in the peaceful rest. Then what leaves? On the breast, may I hear it say to me, Fear not, I'll follow thee. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Trust. 
children happy sabbath and a happy new year we want to thank god because we are in 2021 god has seen us through 2020 and we are so grateful and excited about the future today we are continuing with our journey from egypt to canaan i've got my friends here they are going to tell us what they have learned so far from our journey Alana, what have you learned from the story of Moses? 
forgot he was there from the burning boy. But God said, it's this me, Moses. Go to Egypt and kill so afraid to die to Egypt. But God said, ask your brother Aaron to come if you and go to Egypt. He listened. You listened to God. Well done. Melanie, what have you learned? I've, I've, I've learned that when, when Moses went to Egypt, he was not afraid because God was always with him. Oh, well done. I can see that you've been following and listening. Today, we are continuing with our story and we are going to see all the plagues that happened in Egypt. So, sit quietly, relax and watch the following video as we see how it all happened and it transpired in Egypt. Pharaoh, the Lord God has commanded you to let his people go. Ah, the Lord God of trickery again. Out of my way, Moses, or I'll trample you. Behold his power. And Moses did as the Lord commanded. He lifted up his staff in the sight of Pharaoh and struck the waters and all the river turned to blood. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the waters turned to blood and the fish died and the rivers stank and the Egyptians could not drink. Another clumsy bit of magic? Fine. You poison the water. I don't need to drink water when I have wine. Your heart is hard, Pharaoh. But my God is stronger. The Lord God has instructed me. I will show you that he is the one true God. Pharaoh, cousin, let my people go. This doesn't have to happen. Your people will suffer. Some will die. Enough! Pharaoh is the only god you have to fear, Moses. You'll be the one to die, cousin. And he hit the dust of the earth with his staff, and the dust became lice. Pharaoh's magicians could do nothing. They were lice upon man and beast. Pharaoh hears, but does not listen, Lord. And frogs came up out of the river and spread over the land, and they died in the houses in heaps. Frogs? This is all his god has to torment me with? Frogs? <laughs> 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 then there came swarms of flies. The cattle died, and the land stank. Flies are nothing, Moses. Moses does bad tricks. Exactly. Bad tricks and nothing more. <laughs> The people of Egypt were stricken with sores. Only the children of Israel were spared. This is the finger of God. We've called for Moses. He's here, right now. Perhaps Pharaoh could get him to ask his God to leave us alone. I am God. Never forget that. Yes, Pharaoh. We're sorry, Pharaoh. Ugh. These are worse than the lice and the flies. They speak wisely, Pharaoh. All of this will cease only when you do as the Lord God commands. Let my people go. Release them from their bondage. Leave this place or die. But Pharaoh would not listen. So Moses stretched his hand towards heaven and the Lord rained hail upon the land. Fire ran along the ground. Then locusts came to destroy the crops. Then, 
a darkness came from God. For three days, the earth was covered by darkness. There was only light in Goshen, and the green things slowly died. His God is destroying your kingdom. The crops die. The cattle die. Please send for him, O oh great Pharaoh. Bring me Moses. Take this death from my kingdom! How long will you wait before you see that this is all God's will? Don't hurt your people anymore. God commands you to let his people go. You've seen what the Lord God can do. Don't think that you are greater than God. Who is this God of yours, Moses? The Lord God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. His name! His name! Jehovah! I know no such name! I know no such God! If you don't want to see your people slain, leave this house! The Lord God will bring one more plague upon Egypt. Tonight, at midnight, the Lord will descend upon your kingdom. He will kill every firstborn son, from the rich to the poor in your dungeons. Only the children of Israel will be spared. Tomorrow, you shall set them free, as your great nation mourns and asks, Why didn't Pharaoh heed the words of the Lord God? You are banished from this house! Banished! If I ever see your face again, I'll kill you! I will mourn your loss, Ramses. Goodbye, Pharaoh. Father, I'm the firstborn. I'm afraid. Don't be. This man is nothing. His God is nothing. His people are nothing. Then why am I still scared? Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel, and he said to them, God has spoken to me. This day is the beginning of your journey to the Promised Land. Tonight, you must eat nothing but unleavened bread and the meat of lamb. Let each of you take the blood of the lamb and mark your doors, and don't leave your homes until morning. For tonight, the Lord God will come, and he will deal with your oppressors and will shield you from the destroyer. When death sees the mark of lamb's blood on your doors, he will pass over your homes. He will not hurt any of you. But once we leave this land, you must remember and celebrate this night. This night of the Passover. And the people did as the Lord commanded. us by. Thank God. Yes, but pity the firstborn of Egypt. And at midnight it came to pass, as Moses said, all the firstborn of Egypt were struck. There was not a house where there was not one dead. And a great cry rose up. No! 
Not my son! Not my son! Find Moses! Get me Moses! 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 All the Hebrews of Goshen were spared. My friend, I'm so sorry. You are not my friend. Say nothing to me. Go, take your people and go. Take our riches, I don't care. Serve your God and be gone. We will go. The sons and daughters, the young and the old, the flocks and the herds will go. We all have seen that the Lord God Jehovah lives. Moses, I will not forget what you have done to my kingdom and to me. Welcome back children. I hope you've enjoyed the video and you've seen how God punished Pharaoh and his people. First it was blood, then frogs, then locusts, then lice and a whole lot more until the death of their firstborns. We shouldn't let all these things happen to us as his children. When God says no, we should listen. When, say God's, when God says go, we should go. We shouldn't wait for punishment after punishment for us to real, realize God's will in our lives. When mommy says, don't do it, you shouldn't wait for them to punish you so that you can listen to him. But also, we save a merciful God. He gives us chance after chance after chance to come to him until the last punishment is done. So I pray and hope as we sail through 21, we will all be good listeners and doing God's will. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. Shall we pray? Let's close our eyes as we pray. Dear Jesus, we want to thank you so, so much for looking after us in 2020. Now is the beginning of another year. We thank you and bless your name and hope that you're gonna keep us all safe together with our friends, our families in this 2021. Bless us so that you can, boys and girls, will listen to your word and will listen to mommy and daddy and all the elders around us. Bless us today in Jesus' name, amen. Once again, uh, for our tithes and offerings, uh, we are going to um, have a scripture reading from Psalm 116, verse 12. And um, the reading says, What shall I give unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? As we reflect on this reading, I want us to search our hearts and think of how we can praise God. Uh, we've got uh, bank details um, on the screen where we can give as God has blessed us. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for all the blessings that you've bestowed on us. Now, as we're going to worship you, um, in tithes and offerings, we kindly ask that, Father, what we are going to give to you, you can bless us uh, so that we can always keep knowing that you are God and God alone and that you provide for us. There are so many things that we want, so many things that we wish. I kindly ask that you can only give us those things that will keep us in your sight. I pray for these and other things in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading comes from Hebrews 11 verses 6 and it reads, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who are diligently seek him. May God bless the reading of his word. And let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for protecting us throughout the year. Thank you for another blessing of a, a new year. We come to you, my dear Lord, praising you for protecting our families. We thank you for the fam families which you've uh, provided us with. We pray that you can be with your church. Thank you for another Sabbath. I come to you at this hour, my dear Lord, asking if you can forgive our sins. We know we've sinned in many ways. The way we talked, the way we thought, even the way we did things, my dear Lord, we only ask for, that you forgive us. We come to you at this hour. I pray that, my dear Lord, you can be with your church, be with each and everyone who is uh, watching this program. We pray that you can use your people. We pray for um, the one, one who is going to give us the bread of life who you have chosen, my dear Lord. We pray that as we are going to listen to these words, may you use him, help us to open our hearts and use what you've given us today that we can also share it with others that your close um, coming will be nearer. We also pray at this hour, my dear Lord, I pray especially for those who are sick. Some have been affected by COVID, my dear Lord. Some have been affected by different health illnesses, my dear Lord. I pray for healing in a special way. I pray especially for Lungile. I pray for Sister Nompu, my dear Lord, at this hour. I pray that you can also heal all other people, my dear Lord, because we know you are our healer. You are our great physician. There is no physician who is greater than you. At this hour, I also pray for those who have lost friends and relatives through death, my dear Lord. I pray that you may console them with your Holy Spirit. I also pray that, my dear Lord, even when we have lost our loved ones, may we be reminded that one day we will meet them in, in heaven where we will live, where there will be no more sickness, no death, no more trials and all these difficulties in our lives. Thank you, my dear Lord, um, for giving us an opportunity that we can praise you. And uh, I also pray, my dear Lord, for those who are struggling in these difficult times, my dear Lord. Some have lost their jobs because of this pandemic. Uh, we pray that, my dear Lord, may you protect each and everyone from this pandemic. We pray even for the government uh, who are actually uh, ruling and trying to work things. Uh, we pray that may you also use them, lead them, my dear Lord, because we know that if, um, they, if they learn to trust you and when they know you, everything will go well. We also pray for our children, my dear Lord. We pray for the young ones, the youth. We pray for the church as a whole. I pray for the elders uh, and our pastor, my dear Lord. Be with each and every family represented at this church. I also pray for the SDA church as a whole. Um, be with everyone, the conference and everyone else, my dear Lord. Help us as we are going to start another week. Help us and protect us. Be with each and everyone. We pray that, my dear Lord, we can hear this prayer. Let not my sins hinder you from hearing this prayer. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Happy Sabbath and a, well, a warm welcome to all our regular viewers and our visitors. I hope the Lord is going to bless us through this service. It goes without saying that 2020 was incredibly a difficult year for us. We had our joys and our tears. We had COVID-19 pandemic affecting the whole world. And as we say bye-bye to 2020 and welcome to 2021, I pray that the Lord will take us through as he has done in 2020. And my encouragement and my prayer is that we keep holding on. The title of our message today is Emptiness. And as our text message has been read clearly by our sister, is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I want to share with you a common story that is found in the book of 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. And I invite you to open your Bibles as we go to this passage. I shall be reading to you from the King James Version, and that's where all my references will be coming from. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. That's where we are going to read our story. I shall read in your hearing. 
Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be born men. And Elisha said unto him, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what is thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, and borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all these vessels. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay the debt, and leave thou and thy children of the rest. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Our gracious and loving Father, we want to thank you for the message that you have prepared for us. Our prayer, Lord, today is, may we be encouraged by this message. May this message cultivate and may we cherish the faith of the prophets and the apostles as testified in the Bible. May the faith, may this faith be a faith that will give us uh, courage to hold on, a faith that will not be shaken when it's tested. I pray that you increase our faith after this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Emptiness is our title. Our God is good, gracious, and merciful at all times. What we do not see, God sees. What we do not know, God knows. What we can't do, God can. May I submit to you now that it is not about us working our salvation by ourselves, doing it all by our own mighty or intelligence. Instead, it is all about doing our part faithfully, waiting and trusting God to watch over us, keep us, shield us, protect us, heal us, provide for us, and carry us through life's challenges. If God does not return during our time, we shall continue to face even more trials, conflicts, and tribulations. My encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, is that hold on and do not give up the faith. It will not be long. Weeping may endure through the night, but joy comes in the morning. As the Apostle Paul says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. And again, the prophet of God, Isaiah, also reminds and, and encourages us in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, when he says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Let me just share with you some words of advice 
I got from my best friend who is a motor mechanic when I decided to buy my first car. The words of advice that he gave me are as follow. Number one, all drivers follow the manual, the manufacturer's manual. Do not run your car on empty because it, knows good, it is not good for the engine. And the engine will cut off at any time. He also advised me that running a car on an empty tank may cause a major problem, namely airlock. And airlock is simply <coughs> caused by air filling up the fuel delivery system. Airlock can only be eliminated by a process known as bleeding, which basically means pumping out or sucking up all the air in the fuel delivery system. You might be lucky if you are driving the 21st uh, century cars because they come with an automatic pump which takes over when this problem comes up. He also said, I mean, all the other problems such as a puncture, mechanical or electrical, you can improvise and continue with your journey, but not with airlock because the, empty will be, the tank will be empty. Running on empty is a risk. An empty tank just needs fuel. Therefore, he said, make sure your tank is always full. This is the reason why all cars are fitted with a fuel monitoring symbol or indicator on the dashboard that flashes amber or red automatically whenever the fuel is low or runs empty in the tank. The message of these words of advice to me are just danger. You are running on empty. You need the refueling to continue safely with the journey. As I reflected on these words of advice, they remind me about the story that we get in the Bible, which I'll advise all of us to take our Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 7, as we have just read it. The book of 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 to 7, presents us with a similar story where we are introduced to a widow whose name is not given by the Bible, but it describes her as a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets who cried to the prophet Elisha. The woman has nothing but a jar of oil, verses 1 to 2. A woman whose situation is in peril and in dire need of help. Her husband is dead. Her household is running on empty. As, it, as if that is not enough, she has a debt to pay or else her two sons will be taken away as bondmen by the creditor. A bondman is simply a slave bonded to the master and treated as a property for life. Ever since the devil's defeat from heaven, the intention and desire has been and still is to make people his bond servants through deceptions and ultimately leading them to destruction. My brothers and sisters, in this sinful world, seasons of distress, burdens, trials, and tribulations always before us will require a faith that shall endure the battle of the mind that we are in. That is the battle between good and evil. And a faith that will not faint though severely tested and tried. This woman is in a real fix, brothers and sisters. Unless help comes quickly, she is facing imminent death and shall subsequently lose her two sons forever. Maybe this is a wake-up call to all men who leave their families in debt. I therefore beseech all men to learn a lesson and know what trouble you will leave behind or cause. Therefore, before death knocks at the door, men, put your house in order, for you shall die one day. 
If you cannot leave them any inheritance, please do not leave them in debt. With all due respect to the widows who may be listening to me now, the life experience of a widow is full of challenges to overcome. And may I take this opportunity to share with you some of the challenges. Challenge number one is widowhood, which presents a difficult time in a woman's life, especially when compounded with diminished abilities to meet financial obligations. Her hopes of security and respect in the community are shattered by the death of the husband. She must provide and supply all by herself the human basic needs for her children. She must train them, values and discipline them so that they may be responsible adults in the community before there is no, because there is no fatherhood. Just imagine if these things can sometimes be tough when there is a father figure. What about a lonely widow? In my imagination, I'm sure the widow must have cried loud and silent for help from their relatives, friends, the community, church members, but all was in vain before she cried out to Elisha. To me, the widow's cry is twofold and confirms two points. First, a cry to get out of imminent poverty, the depletion of household provisions, evidenced by only a little oil left in her jar, and for redemption from her helplessness and impending threat from the creditor. Surely help must come soon. Thank God for his love, mess, and grace for his people, because whenever his children cry for help and justice, God hears. Psalms 34 verse 17 has this to say, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. What a tragedy! And how can this happen to one who was once married to the sons of the prophets? But why, you may also be wondering. May I submit to you, brothers and sisters, and say, Remember this and never forget that one can prophesy and still misses heaven. One can cast out demons and still misses heaven. One can perform miracles and still misses heaven. One can attend all church services, fellowship activities, Bible studies, and even camp meetings yearly and still misses heaven. One can be a vegetarian, vegan, and still misses heaven. One can be an elder, a pastor, a departmental head, and still misses heaven. One can be a devout Adventist who returns tithe and gives offerings and still misses heaven. One can be wealthy, educated, and have a successful life according to earthly standards, but can still miss heaven. But, but, brothers and sisters, one cannot live a faithful life and misses heaven. Never. Quite often, whenever Adventists hear the subject of faithfulness, they quickly narrow down their perception to retaining of tithes and the giving of offerings. I want to challenge you today to think outside this perception. I'm talking of complete faith the faith of Enoch that we read in the Bible. This is, a, this is a faith that testifies and pleases God before translation. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 tells us, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because he had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. In her truthful response to Elisha's question, the widow demonstrated some of the highest principles of the kingdom. Honesty, trust, obedience, and faithfulness. They might not be widows in our churches today, but they might be some spiritual widows. Members with spiritual challenges and basic human needs. When members are running on empty, spiritually, 
physically, morally, socially, do we hear them cry? When our youth cry out and grapple in darkness with decision-making, quest for wisdom, counseling, and spiritual nourishment against peer pressure and worldly standards, do we hear them cry? When members who love and fear God cry out, when apostasy, spiritual decay, and moral standards creep into the church, do we hear them cry? There are some of our members who spiritually and morally look enfeebled and defective by standards, by our standards. And what we forget is that they are still the object of Christ's supreme regard and love. They still deserve our spiritual encouragement, nurturing and nourishment than to be condemned or written off. It is one thing to hear them cry and another thing to rescue them from perishing. It is a shame that some members are lonely and invisible and yet among members. To realize and know their value, look upon Jesus at the cross. As members of God's church, instead, we should allow God to impress our minds with duty of care and to work through us to glorify him. Are you a brother's keeper? Brothers and sisters, the only distinction in our lives is found in devotion to the service of others. Obedience and sacrifice is the other lesson we learn from this widow's character. With faith, she obeyed Elisha's commands and her faithfulness was rewarded. Faithfulness is paramount to our salvation. And the Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Did you know that emptiness can be a wonderful gift? It creates a void, an emptiness, a longing that will not give you rest until it is filled. That's the other lesson the destitute woman learned from the prophet Elisha. Thank God for the widow's cry of emptiness. God, the faithful provider, filled her emptiness through his prophet Elisha. Ever since the fall of humanity from glory through Adam and Eve, rebellion in Eden by disobedience, humanity remains sinful, helpless and empty. But thank God for Calvary because through the sacrificial death of Jesus, humanity's emptiness was turned to fullness. The emptiness of the human heart is a sin problem which requires only Jesus to fix. What is sin, brothers and sisters? Sin is a terminal and cancerous problem with no earthly cure. Only God has a solution and he offers to remove the terminally sinful heart and creates a new one if you invite him in your life. Only God in his love and mercy can give us a new heart and put a new spirit within us. He will take away the stony heart out of flesh and give us a heart of flesh. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 19. When Jesus cried out, it is finished in John chapter 19 verse 13. It means to bring an end, to complete or accomplish. For though they did not then understand all, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain, and that the redemption of man was assured, and that the universe was made eternally secure. This is a quotation from the book Desire of Ages, page 764, Ellen White commenting on the universe forever secure. Jesus meant that sin was finished in the past, sin is finished in the present, and sin will remain finished in the future. Sin was defeated once and for all at the cross of Calvary. Sin has no power over us if Jesus is in us. The Bible says one day Elisha meets a woman with nothing, no income, no food, no prospects, no husband, only a jar of oil. 
The Bible says Elisha the prophet asks the woman, Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then Elisha told her, Go, borrow vessels everywhere from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few, and when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour into all these vessels and set aside the full ones. The widow is so honest to tell the truth to the prophet, and the Bible says in John 8 verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. How I pray and wish that as Christians, if we could know and understand that it pays to be honest and vice versa not to. By the way, Elisha's miracles were acts of real charity, as opposed to many miracles being performed today for cash-generating purposes, where poor innocent members are ripped off of their hard and cash and trust by the so-called prophets. These are not true prophets, brothers and sisters. Biblically, true prophets prophesy for free and charge no money. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Matthew chapter 10 verse 8 tells us this. The prophet tells her to gather what she has. She returns with a jar of oil and several empty ones. She then keeps on pouring until all the jars are full. Only then does the oil in the first jar stop. It is so interesting to note, brothers and sisters, that the woman gets as much oil as she, was, as she has empty jars. I cannot emphasize it more, brothers and sisters, that we will never exhaust God's blessings as long as we remain faithful. It is always our faith that fails, not his promise. God can give us more blessings than we ask, even in the storms of life. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word. According to the passage, when the woman is told what to do, in this case, to go and gather or borrow, not just a few, she never asked, what are they for? Why not few? Why not so many? Or how do I carry them? I'm just a widow. How long is your plan going to take? And how effective is this plan, Elisha? Instead, she obeys the prophet's instruction as is given to him. My brothers and sisters, how often do we question many times God's commandments and even rationalize our circumstances in order to justify our actions for our compromise backslide, failure, and disobedience. Sin is a burden to all men. God wants us to surrender all to him, even all our inadequacy, because his biddings are his enablings. Jesus is calling you and me to come to him daily for deliverance from wrath, guilty, from sin and the devil, from all our cares, fears, and sorrows. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, verse 28. There is rest and relief from every care at Jesus' feet. Jesus never disappoints and will never disappoint anyone who decides to worship him in truth and in spirit. But why this elaborate way to raise money? Verses 2 to 7. Another lesson from this story is the fundamental doctrine which every believer must understand and believe in this spiritual journey. Deeds, not words, or faith and works. These two are inseparable. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. Instead of being proud, we find or we see here Elijah humbles himself, though being a prophet and get 
and a great man to regularly receive and attend to the needs of this poor widow. Pride is a sin before God, brothers and sisters. Only our greatness in this spiritual journey is the greatness of humility. Our only distinction is found in devotion to the service of others. Elisha helped the widow to pay back her debt and to maintain her family. Are you a blessing to those around you and to those who cry for help? In this spiritual journey, I want to remind you that we walk by faith and not by sight. What is faith, brothers and sisters? According to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, as clearly read as our sister read it to us. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is like the buying power of a customer. You can choose and pick anything you want with no fear or restriction. Faith is having something before you actually hold it. Therefore, faith is a product of trust and obedience. Faith is belief in action. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? James chapter 2, verse 20. You cannot separate faith from works, even though the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith alone. Ephesians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. James does not argue that good works are required for our salvation. Nor does he say that deeds are more important than beliefs. Rather, James insists that there are two types of faith, one complete and the other incomplete. Faith made complete, we read this in verse 22, and faith without deeds, we read this in verse 20. Both are beliefs in one sense of the word, but different. Complete faith goes deeper than just right thinking to right living. Right thinking is not just saving faith. There is a belief that is not a saving faith. The word declares that the devil believes and trembles. The so-called faith that does not work by love and purify the soul will not justify any man. Abraham believed God. How do we know that he believed? His works testified to the character of his faith, and his faith was accounted to him for righteousness. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 936, paragraph 4. Faith, does not stop at, faith that stops at the intellectual level is incomplete and very dangerous because even the demons have that type of faith. We read this in verse 19. This story is the testimony of true test of trust, obedience, and complete faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is a chapter of heroes of faith, and Enoch is recorded as one of them. The instruction from Elisha was very simple. Go and borrow vessels. This alone required faith from the widow to accomplish. Brothers and sisters, our God has made salvation simple and free from everyone to be saved. Like Elisha's plan of, sol of solving the widow's empty situation, so is God's plan of salvation for sinful humanity and victory over sin. Jesus' request to you and me for our daily challenges is simple. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I believe God has so many ways of saving his people from their sins, and having faith is one simple way. Salvation is all about taking God at his word. Commenting about faith in Exodus chapter 14, verses 16 and 15, Ellen White writes, It was by faith that they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. In marching down to the very water, they showed that they believed the word of God as spoken by Moses. They did all that was in their power to do, and then the mighty one of Israel divided the sea to make a path for their feet. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 290. 
under the subtitle Faith Demonstrated. I want us to note the sequence here from the widow's complete faith. First is the right decision. Then from the right decision is the right action. And ultimately providence, the fulfillment of the widow's desires. So then, just like the widow's situation, we do need faith more than anything. Only the right kind of faith, only complete faith, faith that saves. And all our daily relationship and our responses to God's call will prove what type of faith we have, whether incomplete or complete. Paul, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, tells us that there would be a people who will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, and from such people turn away. Our God hates fake and pretends and is giving us a strong warning through Ellen White in the book of Patrick's and Prophet, page 317, where she comments, How often in our own day is the love of pleasure disguised by a form of godliness, a religion that permits men, while observing the rites of worship, to devote themselves to selfish and sensual gratification, is as pleasing to the multitudes now as in the days of Israel. And they are still pliant aarons who, while holding positions of authority in the church, will yield to the desires of the unconsecrated and thus encourage them in sin. Under the subtitle, Don't Forget the Past. True Christians and last day saints are revealed in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What is the faith of Jesus, brothers and sisters? The faith of Jesus has been rejected and ignored by many Christians. And yet it is the power to save. Many Christians today separate law and the gospel. And yet Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 brings the law and the gospel together. The two are compatible. Christians who refuse to obey and trust God's commandments are equally refusing the power of Christ in them. Referring to the story of Elisha and the widow, the miraculous power of the filling up of the jars with oil depended only on the availability of the empty jars, which the widow must bring first before being filled. Christians will only become more than conquerors when they surrender their lives to Jesus first and then accept him as the shelter in the time of storm. Therefore, the faith of Jesus, according to Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, refers to Christians who have accepted the righteousness of Christ in their lives. They have allowed Christ to live his perfect life in them and thus living a holy and sanctified life. Elisha's method compelled the widow to put her faith into action by obeying Elisha's commands. As she pours the oil into jar after jar, she sees God turning small blessings into bountiful provisions to meet all your needs. It is not about the magnitude or intensity of life's challenges or trials, but it's about the quality of our faith we have in order to endure. The trial of our faith is more precious than gold before God, brothers and sisters. It is only by living our faith that we can receive his promises. It's not about any earthly recognition, but surrendering all to Jesus. Little becomes much when God is in it, and obedience is better than sacrifice. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. God cares for those who trust and obey his commandments. God is always ready to magnify his goodness with his power to those who remain steadfast in the faith of Jesus. It is our lack of faith that fails and not God's promises and his blessings. No one has ever been 
and will never ever exhaust or quench God's blessings. Love, no one has never been and will never ever exhaust, I repeat, or quench God's blessings, love, mercy, and his grace. God gives us more than we ask if we truly take heed to his word. Wherever there are empty vessels, there is always more than enough for God to supply and fill them. Enough for each one and enough for everyone. Our Savior and Redeemer's all-sufficient saving power and grace will only be stopped from supplying our needs for sinners and saving our souls when there is no more cry to him for salvation. Some of us may not experience miracles in our lives just like the widow, but we can truly be assured of his mercies, provisions, strength, and security. There is something interesting about emptiness that moves or touches God's heart, brothers and sisters. Sometimes God can allow emptiness in our lives not to afflict us or cause misery, but that we learn to depend on him for provisions, strength, protection, perseverance, and courage to endure the tribulations. Sometimes God can allow us to go through chilly deep waters when we cannot even swim or to be thrown into fairy furnace of life's trials for our purification but for his power and glory to be manifested. Could we still be distracted and be dependent on ourselves? In closing, may I just emphasize that the story of Elisha and the widow reminds us of the following. Emptiness is a gift from God. In all our life situations or circumstances, we need to be thankful to God and not despair or give up. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34. And keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Only those who are willing to deny self, pride, and agonize before God, praying unceasingly and earnestly for his blessings, will obtain it. Emptiness tells us that we have a need. The void in our hearts, because of the inherent Adamic nature after sin, can never be quenched by anything except God's love. Our helplessness, our broken hearts, should compel us to cry out for help to be filled by him. The solution is to remain steadfast in complete faith. It may be possible that we may not be empty enough. Our failure to wrestle with God daily, cry out for pardon, righteousness, and sanctification from him increases our love for the world and causes our lives to revolve around earthly pleasures and decrease our mission and call to God's work. We must admit our emptiness. Sin is, a, is terminal and destructive. We shall all I mean, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. In this spiritual warfare, our only safety and victory is found in him. We need to put on the complete armor of faith so that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, Ephesians 6, verse 11. Only God can truly fill our emptiness. Church members, friends, other people can let us down. They can reject us, ignore us, or not even hear us when we cry. But only God is always close by and even hears our faintest cry. Brothers and sisters, before I pray, I want to encourage and pray for and with someone who might be uh, crying over a long period of time and seems not to be heard. I want to pray and encourage someone who might be on the verge of giving up. I want to pray and encourage with someone 
who might think God doesn't care. Someone who might be asking, does Jesus care? Oh yes, he cares. He has cared for you up to this time and he will continue to care for you if only you surrender yourself fully to his will and guidance. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for the story of the widow that you have reminded us that it is only by faith that we can be victorious. Because of this story, we pray that you increase our faith and give us the, a faith that is complete, a faith that will not shaken when it's tried and tested. As we live in this world which is full of trials and tribulations, we pray that you continue to remind us that it is only by faith that we can be victorious. And when you shall come to take your loved ones, you are only going to come to take those who have waited upon you faithfully. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. our elder, Elder Mavuti, for allowing the Lord to use him in such a wonderful way and for sharing this timely message. I hope that we've all been blessed. Can we stay safe? And also to remember to tune in at 3 p.m. for our Bible study. Thank you and God bless you.